I'm Darren Walker. I'm vice president of the Rockefeller Foundation in New York, and I'm delighted to uh, co-chair this afternoon session. Um, I've been looking forward to this because as a New Yorker, the opportunity to come to Mumbai is, um, is quite extraordinary for me because as a New Yorker, I feel a kinship with, with Mumbai. There is a, a kinetic energy about this city and what Jane Jacobs called the sort of messy organicness, um, the order within the disorder that I feel very at home with here. And so even though I, I am from New York and have a, a sort of a, an American sensibility, um, I'm really here to learn from you. And I think all of us um, who come from uh, America see this as an opportunity to learn. And I'm just delighted to have uh, the opportunity to hear from people uh, I've known and respected um, for a number of years this afternoon. I do want to just say very briefly that this idea of globalization that many of us have embraced, I think today we've, we've really highlighted uh, some of the downsides, the sort of reductionist approach that globalization seems to always drive us to a value chain analysis and our trying to figure out where we are on the value chain. And there's something about that that actually is, is not good for a society. And when we talk about inequality, as, as Richard Sennett does so eloquently, and I reflect on several references already today of, of the greatness and the wonder of New York's Central Park, I also have to reflect on the fact that what you could not see in any of the visuals was what has happened at the north end of Central Park, the Harlem end of Central Park, that was populated for many, many years by poor African Americans who now are being displaced because Central Park has become such an important piece of real estate. And there are so many lessons for those of us who believe that public space has to be owned by all the citizenry of the experience of Central Park and while as a New Yorker, I'm immensely proud of that park and what it represents. I'm also immensely troubled by the current circumstance. So we're going to talk about housing this afternoon. And we all know that housing is really the platform for access and opportunity. And in, in Mumbai, um, there's a lot to learn about housing, both good and bad. And we're very lucky to have a group of panelists who are going to share uh, some, I think, important perspectives and learnings. Um, the, the process is we will have a two-part session. The first part is going to feature uh, a, set, a series of presentations. Um, first, uh, by S.S. Um, Shritriya, who is the uh, Principal Secretary of the Housing Department of the Government of Maharashtra. We'll then hear about Dharavi, which is um, a community I have been obsessed with since my days of working in Harlem and meeting uh, the amazing Jakim Apertham, who I had the pleasure of befriending a number of years ago and who has been a learning partner for me. And Jakim and Sheila Patel have been two people I have relied on uh, for intelligence and information, and I'm so looking forward to this presentation. We'll also hear from Mukesh Mehta, who is the chairman of MM Project Consultants. And finally, we'll have an opportunity to have some reflections by a distinguished panel of international urbanists. And at the top of that list, of course, is Enrique Penalosa, the amazing former mayor of uh, Bogota, Colombia. Jose Castillo, who is a professor, and I know you're in Mexico, but we'd like to, at the University of Pennsylvania, also claim you too, Jose. And finally, Matias Antonovi, who is a researcher at the University of Tokyo. But before we uh, begin our presentations, I wanted to turn it over to uh, my co-chair, Nasa Manje, from the Development Credit Bank, for a few remarks. I'm supposed to be here, and it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, the last uh, thing I was expecting is to be chairing a session, but uh, here I am. Uh, just a few uh, remarks. I thought I'll just make a few remarks on the context of the city, the context of housing in the city, and housing finance. I think these are the three major issues I think which will probably creep up in the discussions that we're going to have. 
When I was the cha uh, president of the Bombay Chamber of Commerce a few years ago, I had a small survey of CEOs and asked them a very simple question, are you upsizing or downsizing in Bombay? And give me the reasons why you're doing what you're doing. About 80% of CEOs said they were downsizing in Bombay. And the reason was, the first, topmost reason was the cost of doing business. Two was the labor market, the difficulty of attracting people to the city uh, from outside. So you had to rely on the local labor market. The problems of social infrastructure, getting into clubs, getting kids into schools, and the physical infrastructure, and the traffic and all the other associated problems. And we have seen since then, of course, the situation getting worse. And we have seen the rise of other cities, Chennai, Hyderabad, Pune, a whole range of cities that are really looking at the back offices of a lot of the companies that still headquartered in Bombay. So there is this context. The housing context really is been a major issue and we go back, Joachim, for how many years? 25, 30 years. In the 70s, the whole debate was housing rights. I mean, just fighting for the people to the right to live in slums, I mean, to live in informal settlements. Uh, because the bulldozers were very prevalent in those days. Uh, and that battle was won after a decade of, I think, uh, very vigorous uh, uh, debate as well as uh, activism. Now, of course, the issue is how do we house them? I don't think anybody's talking about bulldozing the poor. Um, I think the, the, the improvements of infrastructure in Bombay are really creating this whole issue of project-affected people. You know, you have to make room for infrastructure, you've got to widen roads, you have to build bridges, and obviously any infrastructure you put in is going to displace people. So in a sense, a lot of the discussion took place about five years ago on how we are going to uh, re uh, rehouse people in projected affected areas. And I think that triggered a lot of uh, thinking about how we can actually broaden that scope to beyond the project affected people. So you're seeing that emerge. To my mind, there are two or three very basic issues, and I think they will crop up in the discussion, is that the biggest issue for housing the poor is going to be the issue of land. Um, the land supply curve in Bombay is extremely steep. It's very inelastic. So a small change in shift in demand means a huge increase in prices and rather small response on quantity on the ground. And we are seeing that today. I mean, you're seeing at the high end, $1,000 a square foot is what, the, uh, what, uh, what our residential premise costs you. And those costs, of course, go down right through the market. But if you thought of conditions more favorable to having slums and informal settlements and a lack of improvement, you could not think of a more favorable circumstance that Bombay has today. Uh, in a sense, we need a revolution in terms of the context of which housing gets done. I think a lot of solutions are found within the constraints that we ourselves have set. So if we start opening up those boundaries, we can get much more done much more quickly. We have an act which was mentioned, the Urban Land Sealing Act, which this state is the last to remove. Almost every state has removed the Urban Land Sealing Act. For, for, for some reason, Maharashtra will hang on to the ULCA. Uh, and I, got, I, I suspect it has a lot to do with Bombay. Uh, the second is the Rent Act. We have a very, very draconian Rent Act, which actually limits the rental housing that's available. You have a planning process which requires 65 permissions to even start moving, and it takes you two and a half years to get projects off the ground. That has been crashed a little, uh, but it's still uh, a very tortuous process. Um, so all of this makes the supply curve extremely... Uh, inelastic. So any change in demand will be price-driven rather than uh, supply-driven on the ground. Uh, and finally, let me just come to housing finance. Um, I was involved, and the Chirish is on the board with me, but I've been involved with the housing finance company, which we helped set up for the last 30 years. Um, and we've got the experience of now it's become a hugely successful uh, conglomerate of financial institutions. Um, but even 30 years down the road, if you look at the profile and portfolio of HDFC's uh, customers, they are salaried 
organized people. There are very few people who finance the self-employed. And the self-employed are the ones who live in informal settlements. It's not that they don't have money. It's not that they don't have cash flows. It's just that we don't have a system uh, that would take those risks with those cash flows. I was with my bank reviewing some of the delinquency issues only yesterday, and we looked at the whole banking system, and we saw that at the end of the day, the delinquency ratios that the banks are finding of, of loans above 200,000 and with incomes, household incomes of less than 20,000 rupees a month is extremely high. So what you're gonna have is a lot of institutions falling out of the space. And that's going to really affect the demand side uh, for, for people to enter the housing market. So if they cannot get housing finance, they can't enter the market. And on the supply side, you have an extremely elastic supply curve, which is not creating the sort of housing that we need. So you have a double whammy here, uh, which is going to affect uh, housing for the poor. Um, in a sense, uh, Kirti Shah, who did a lot of the fighting on housing rights about 20 years ago, I love the statement he made, many, uh, at a, at a, at a, I think at an international conference. He says, you know, India has two major institutions for housing. HUTCO and HDFC. HUTCO is the Housing and Urban Development Corporation, sits in Delhi, and HDFC was the housing finance institution that I was involved with. And he said, the trouble is that one understands nothing about housing, which is supposed to be HDFC, and one understands nothing about finance, which is HUTCO. So, uh, so you know, you have, this, uh, you have this dilemma that you have an institutional structure but in a guess, I think what India, I'm going to stop in one second. India has an emerging first world financial sector and, um, uh, and you have third world problems, very much like South Africa. So I think that is going to be the issue. How do you bridge this gap? Thank you very much. I'm sorry if I've taken a little longer. Thank you, Nasser. So